Brad and Casey. I'm Brad Carline, the Navajo County Attorney. My usual partner, Casey Clark, the Navajo County Sheriff, duty called and he couldn't join us today. And our guest today is Mary Springer, the Emergency Management Services Director from Navajo County. Did I get that right? Well, you're close. What is it, Mary? <laughs> Emergency Management Director for Navajo County. And what does Emergency Management do in Navajo County? Actually, we are the, the folks that when we have an emergency, we help coordinate resources. Um, we have uh, law enforcement that make sure people are safe. We have fire folks that make sure they, they've got the fires well taken care of, but when they need things, they contact us. And we have other partners, such as state partners, or other partners that we um, get resources for them. So you're kind of the coordinator to bring all these assets together in the time of emergency? Correct, and we also keep track of what's out there so we can we can request our reimbursements. When we think of emergencies here in, in Navajo County in Northeast Arizona, probably what pops to mind first is fires, the Rodeo Chetiskai, the Wallow Fire. Is that a lot of what you guys work on and prepare for? We look at it as Fire, flood, freeze, because they're all seasonal. Fires are, you know, April to June, July. Floods come after that with our monsoons, and then after that we get winter and we have freezes. So that's kind of our seasons. Well, let's start with fire, because that's kind of the season we're in. Luckily for us, May was a very, very moist month, and our fire danger seems to be down from, from what it typically is. But what do you and your team do to get prepared for the fire season? Well, we have a team called the White Mountain uh, Fire Restrictions Coordinating Group. And that's people from all different agencies across the state, really, because we have Greenlee County, we have Graham County, Coconino County, of course, Navajo and Apache County, but we have Forest Service, State Forestry, and then all the local supporting agencies. And we get together weekly on a teleconference and discuss what's the conditions, what's the fire, you know, what's being forecasted for weather, you know, what, what resources are available if we did have something happen. So we kind of put all those things together, um, kind of like an intelligence gathering session to make decisions if we should go into restrictions or not. So you talk about going into restrictions, and I, what does that exactly mean? Um, the county, Navajo County and Apache, both have fire restrictions, emergency fire restrictions. And so we have a stage one and a stage two Stage one means that you can still have your barbecues and your, your campfires, but they have to be contained. Smoking is generally inside of a vehicle. And then if we have to step it up to stage two, then it restricts no wood burning, no campfires, except for propane. You talked about Apache and Navajo having these restrictions, but that would only apply to the county portions of the area. What about the municipalities, the Forest Service, uh, BLM, and state lands? Well, that uh, we are the unincorporated areas for the counties, but the, because the state is on the call, Forest Service is on the call, and the local municipalities are on the call, um, they tend to go in when we do this as a joint operation, they all tend to go in at the same time. So we coordinate it. Um, one of the things that has been said that fire knows no boundaries. So it doesn't know if it's in Navajo County or Apache County, or if it's on BIA or forestry. So we try to coordinate it so we're all in at the same time. So say we have to call for the first level of restrictions. How do we let the public know about that? We do a media campaign. We get with the radio stations, the newspapers. We have trap lines, which we hang posters, letting people know. We use the ADOT um, big message boards, and our local fire guys are really good about going um, to local events and letting people know what stage we're in and what's going on. 
And are there any penalties for those who violate stage one restrictions? There's penalties, yes. And uh, they, I know last year, um, Sheriff Clark had a plane that they had for the weekends. I would fly over to see if we had smoke while we were in restrictions because it was you weren't supposed to be having fires. And they did cite, and those folks did have to go to court on those citations. And say the worst case scenario occurred and we had a fire started. How do people get information on the status of the fire, what they should be doing or worried about? We have 311 info, which is uh, we have the web and we also have the phone where people can call from your cell phones, 311, and from Frontier Landlines. And you can get fire updates, you can get emergency management updates and health updates. And then we post things on the web. You can also subscribe to our Twitter. And that's where we put vetted information. When you say vetted information, what type of information are you putting out? Um, any, anything that we know where the fire has advanced to, um, any kind of pre-evacuations or areas that have been evacuated. If 311 is also a live call center, if things do get spun up into a bigger event, then we have people that will answer the phones. It'll be a live call center. And say we're getting to the point that it's a pre-evacuation. Uh, you know, some of the things you talked about, the 311 website, phone number, those are people calling into you. How do you push out the information to an area that may need to get ready and prepared to evacuate? Well, it, interesting, your timing is great on that one. We have reverse 911, and we are, we've just uh, replaced that with, it's gonna be ready Navajo County. And so people can subscribe, they can go in and uh, put their information, their phone number, their contact information. And we can actually segregate that by geographics. So say we had a wall of fire that came into a Navajo County area, we could actually warn people by their cell phones or their landlines or by email. So is that something people have to opt in? And what happens if they didn't opt in? The frontier folks that have landlines, which I know is becoming a thing of the past, mm -hmm. um, those folks will be automatically um, trunked over. But people that only have cell phones will have to register on our website. And that's that 311 website? Um, that's actually on Navajo County. And we're, we're in the state of changing from the reverse 911 to ready Navajo County. That'll be up and running sometime towards the end of June. Okay. Um, and then, so the same process then, if the evacuation order comes, they'll be notified through this ready Navajo County. Navajo, Navajo County program? They'll, that way, and if we had to, I know the sheriff's office, they have a law enforcement plan that uh, talks to how things would be evacuated, how people would, communities would be evacuated in, in case of an emergency. Is it mandatory that they receive notice to evacuate or can people be foolish and stay? I remember there was a few during the Rodeo Chetiskai that, that stayed even though they were requested numerous times to leave. Adults can be responsible for themselves and they can stay, but then they're, they're confined to their house. But if they have children under the age of 18, they will be removed. They will be mandatorily evacuated. It was a couple months ago, I think, you had a big meeting here in Sholo uh, with a lot of the entities that provide services during fires. What was that all about? Well, that came out of last fire season. We always have an after action. And one of the things we talked about was getting together with our first responders and our other our volunteer agencies and a lot of the support agencies that we all work together in times of an emergency. We don't tend to get together much outside of an emergency. So we put together a media day and we invited the local media and all, well I wouldn't say all, but many of our first responders are our partner agencies. And it was very successful as far as the networking event that went by. And uh, we had some really, really good guest speakers, such as Pascal Berlow, talking about the forest industry and the, the types of activities that they do to try and help make it a healthy forest. Same with Jonathan Brooks, who is the White Mountain Apache Forest Super Supervisor. 
So very, very good event. What were some of the other entities that showed up for your, your event? We had state emergency management. We had uh, state forestry, uh, U.S. Forest Service. We had the Sheriff's Auxiliary Volunteers, Search and Rescue, Red Cross, Salvation Army, uh, Sholo Fire, Sholo PD, um, the, the d different law enforcement agencies, BIA. So quite, quite a few in a small space. Do you guys develop plans of actions ahead of time that you can pull up and use if something happens? We have emergency operations plans that give us guidelines on what we need to do and who we need to notify, depending on the event. But, you know, all events are scalable, right. depending on the size and the complexity. So we just are very fortunate to have good partners. You know, you've talked about the, some of the main ones you prepare for are weather related, be it forest fires, flooding, or uh, the freeze. But what about, we, you know, we have a train that runs through the center part of our county. Do you have stuff related to that in case there's hazardous materials and it derails like it did in Kingman a couple decades ago? Well, we, we've actually attended recently a railroad training put on by uh, BNSF. And we found out that there's a lot more resources out there than we realized. So that's a help. Um, another thing that we're working with Sheriff Clark and uh, Chief Deputy Brandon Eager is to put together a regional hazmat, like a first response group. So that's something that's in the works now. We currently don't have that. And then do you have an operations center that would be, that's a physical location to run your emergencies out of? We have, we call it the virtual EOC. We do have a presence in Holbrook at the new public works building, but the way we roll is our folks have laptops. They even have their radio communications on their laptops. So we could be anywhere as long as we can get internet. We can, uh, we can function as an EOC and we don't all have to be sitting in the same room. Are there, you know, say we do have like a forest fire, are there certain, um, for lack of a better term, utilities, be it cell towers or trans power transfer stations that you try to protect more as part of your plan? Because you talked about needing internet and a lot of it comes from our cell towers anymore. Correct. And a good thing with our providers, they do have portable, they have something called a communication on wheels or a cow. Seems like we <laughs> like to name things. We have a toad, which is our communications vehicle. Um, but we do have ways of communicating. And when you talk about uh, assets that are gonna be protected, the first thing that they look to protect is lives, right. communities and lives. Then they look at infrastructure and see what's threatened. So you have a plan on all those and where they're located and, and, and how best in different disasters to try to protect them? Uh, yes, and that's mostly the um, law enforcement and fire agencies when they, like the incident command, that's one of the first things that they ask is, what do you have here that we need to be concerned about? Does the county government and the municipal governments also have their own plans? Because some parts of government don't end and you have tons of records you need to protect. D does Navajo County have its own plan in case of an emergency or an evacuation? Navajo County has what we call the um, continuation of operations plan. So in the event of an emergency, even to the point where we can't operate out of Holbrook or Sholo, we have a plan that says what's our essential records, what do we need to maintain, and what do we need to continue our operations. So that's something they have thought through and are prepared for. Thought through, prepared for, and like any other plan, it's always in a state of revision because new technology comes on, new people come on, new record requirements come on, so we've always uh, take a look at those plans at least on an annual basis and update them. So the county's prepared in case of an emergency. How about a, a citizen in, in our community? What should they do to be prepared and what are helpful uh, links that they can look at to help them prepare in case of an emergency? The, the best link and the easiest one to remember is called ready.gov. And if you went online and you typed that in, 
it is a wealth of information. It talks about personal preparedness, uh, pet preparedness, fire information, how to protect your home. So that would be the first website that uh, I would point people to. Another one is AZEIN, and that one is um, sponsored by the State Department of Emergency and Military Affairs. And so they have a lot of good current information as well as links to um, preparedness for individuals and families and communities. I remember during the Rodeo Chetiskai, my family got evacuated and it was hard to decide what to put in a car. You have a house full of stuff and yet you can only take what fits in the car along with the family members. And I remember those were some difficult choices. Difficult, but you know if you pre-plan, that's, that's kind of the key here is, you know, have a list already made, have a go kit already put together. So the things that you know you're going to forget, if they're already packed, all you have to do is remember to grab one thing. If you don't grab that one thing, then you're, I guess you're a, you have a problem, but, you know, make it easy on yourself and do some pre-planning. And I remember during the Rodeo Cheddar Skies, some people were evacuated over to the Dome and Round Valley area. Uh, like my parents from the Hebrew Overguard area, they were evacuated down to Payson. Is that something that's part of your plan, where you can take people to, how to get them there, then who's going to service them from having cots to sleep on to food to feed them? Well, the nice part about that is we work with the Salvation Army and the American Red Cross, and we work with local providers on space, you know, whether it's the schools or the local churches. Um, and every event is different. You know, you may need 30 spaces for 30 people or you may need space for 300. It depends on the size and complexity. But yes, we do have plans for that as well. And you had mentioned when you were telling people, I think it was ready.gov for preparedness, it included a section on pets and animals. Uh, and a lot of people in this area have livestock, be it horses and other things. So is that also part of your plan where you can take like horses and other large animals in case of a, an emergency? Yes, and Wall of Fire was probably the most recent that I can remember. We had state agriculture involved. We, the Humane Society actually came up here and located at the Sholo Animal Shelter. So we work with those different agencies and the local um, animal enforcement groups. And, and we le work with volunteers not only to trailer and haul them to a different location, but for those animals that can't be relocated. Um, there are folks that are trained um, with uh, fire training, red card trained, so they can go across the fire lines and feed and, and check in on animals. So it sounds like as a part of your response teams, there's a, a large number of volunteers. Uh, is there specialized training that they can get? And if they're interested, where could they get that training? Who would they contact? There is a lot of specialized training. And for us, when we call on volunteers, we have um, a set of classes that we have to take, FEMA-approved classes, that you have to take to even be on the list. That way, we all know how to act and behave and how we operate as um, responders. And every agency that would come out to an emergency like that has to take those initial first few classes. But the American Red Cross, the Salvation Army, Navajo County, the local fire districts and departments, and the law enforcement agencies all have volunteer arms that they, they would love for people to volunteer, and our health department as well. So reach out to those agencies first, and then they'll guide them as to where to get the training to be prepared and, and ready to, to assist? Correct. Um, what areas of volunteers do you think you need the most? And which way would you direct them? Would it be the health department, the sheriff's office, or some other one? I would say in the sheriff's office, auxiliary volunteers and search and rescue, and also our medical reserve corps and our CERT volunteers. And they all have a uniqueness about what they do. So it's really, what does the person who wants to volunteer, what do they want to get involved with? You know, save volunteers, which is uh, auxiliary volunteers, do crowd control, traffic control, that kind of thing. Um, 
not always the most pleasant weather to work in or conditions. Search and rescue, you know, they look for people that are missing or, you know, people that need to be recovered. Medical reserve, if you have a talent for medical, like nurses, doctors, LPNs, people that want to assist patients. And then, uh, you know, the local uh, humane societies, they also teach people how to care for animals. You, you use the term CERT volunteer. What is a CERT? CERT is communi community, uh, ah, community Emergency Response Team. And that's local folks that come together that learn how to, um, they can do traffic control. They're kind of like an all-purpose, multifunctional crew that um, in times of emergency, they can help with folks that need sheltering. They can help um, remove debris from a storm, um, crowd control. It's just they're there's a lot of different functions that they perform. It's hard to say this is what they do. They'll do anything. But they get training. They, they go through CERT program training, and then they work together as a team. And I assume there's continual training they have to get each year. Uh, so how much time is involved to get the initial training, and then how much time is involved to get that continuous training? To go through CERT training initially, I believe it's two days, and then there's a three-day training after that. And then if they really, really like the training, there's uh, they could become a CERT instructor. And that's more training and then a program manager. So there's different levels of CERT. Um, you can be just the volunteer that gets called and shows up, or you can actually go and get the training to teach other people how to be CERT members. And do you have to have any specific background to do this or just a desire to help your neighbor? A desire to help your neighbor and be available because that's one of the problems that we've run into is we have people that have a good heart and volunteer but then things happen and they don't they don't participate so you know we need people that when you get a phone call in the middle of the night sometimes not the best conditions but you know when you're called you need to show up. So you've got to have a commitment to go with your desire. Yes. Probably one of the, the latest events that I know that your team was called out for is when we had the white powder scare at the county. Um, can you just give us an idea of what all that entailed for you and your emergency management team? Well, mostly that was kind of a strange exercise, if you will. Um, <laughs> thank goodness it was an exercise and not goodness. a reality. Yes. And we were split, and that was kind of a challenge for us. You know, usually we have a team where we can communicate, we see each other, um, but we were remote in two different directions. We, some people were at the complex, some people at public works. What we did mostly was try to provide communications and information to employees. And again, you know, I talk about the vetted information. We're not going to put information out that's incorrect or not doesn't give enough information, but we also found some issues that came up, how we need to respond better and what we need to do to keep our employees better informed. And it sounds from what you've been talking about, Mary, that a large part of the role for emergency management is facilitation. So when you have this emergency, it sounds like others with the expertise may actually guide things, such as that white powder scare, you had the hazmat team from DPS, you had the biohazard people from the county health department. Is that an accurate description of how things work with your team? Pretty much. We, uh, anything that they need, you know, during that event, um, we were getting phone calls for the things that they needed, like Timber Mesa uh, gladly uh, volunteered and she came out and helped us out. DPS, so we were in there making phone calls and trying to connect, you know, the resources with the team over at the Public Works building. And then, you know, I guess I have a little bit of insight because I've <laughs> seen the inside of some of this, but it sounds like you have a lot of positions that are filled with your emergency management team that may not be day-to-day -day members of your team, but somebody outside. You have your communications, you have your logistics, you have your incident command team as a whole. How, how do those teams look? 
Well, we have a couple people that are dedicated to emergency management full time. And when I say a couple, I mean two, <laughs> it, among other duties as assigned. But then the rest of the folks come from regular day jobs. They work in public works. They work in uh, facilities management. They work in the health department. They work in the sheriff's office. So when we need to come together, we make a phone call and uh, let pe we alert people. We have radios that we can communicate with. So we you know, get the team together for the items that we need. And again, I told you it was scalable. So if we don't need a PIO or we don't need a logistics section chief and we need just uh, an operations person, we can scale it for what we need. So very flexible and able to contract or expand in a given situation. Absolutely. Mary, thank you so much for joining us today on Shooting Straight. And thank you for watching this episode of Shooting Straight with Brad and Casey. And after this brief message, we'll have this month's Most Wanted. Thanks. Parents, don't let teens take prescription drugs from your medication cabinet. Dispose of unwanted and expired drugs at a drug drop box near you. For locations, visit www.navajocountyaz.gov. For this month's Most Wanted, the Navajo County Sheriff's Office is currently seeking the location of a wanted suspect identified as Michael Thomas Oakman. Oakman is a 47-year-old male, is 5'10", 175 pounds, with green eyes and blonde hair. Oakman currently has four arrest warrants for the following felony and misdemeanor violations. Possession of a dangerous drug for sale, dangerous drugs use and possession, disobeying a lawful court order, possession use of marijuana. Anybody with information about Mr. Oakman's location should contact Navajo County Sheriff's Office or WeTip at 1-800-78-CRIME.